this is our uh, afternoon session with uh, mental health and um, so this is Dr. Shea who's a, a, a clinical assistant professor of rehabilitation medicine at Rusk Institute the division of NYU Langone Medical Center and uh, he's Dr. Shea has been the, uh, is the assistant director previously of the NYU Brain Injury Treatment Day program He's the president of North Psychological Evaluation and Treatment Services. It's in both New York and Quincy, Mass, and sp specializes with traumatic brain injury, tick-borne disease, uh, emergency intervention. He's been a consultant on national and international uh, health care delivery issues and um, the, the United Nations Development Program. So, Dr. Shea. And he's also... Uh, the incoming president of ILADS, and he's been on the board. Thanks, and I have a, it's always great to have the outgoing president introduce you, you build up my, not only do I have a great legacy in, in Bob, but it's also nice for him to build me up this way, you know, try to give me some, <clears throat> some authority, um, which if you really know me, I probably don't have much of, but anyway. Uh, um, although I am authentic, so that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's not good. So, so what we're going to talk about today is the dangers of self-medication in adolescents and young adults with Lyme disease because that is a specific danger, as many of you probably know, and we're going to get through this because unfortunately it was supposed to be. Uh, there we go. Five. So, um, first we've got to discuss what chronic illness is, and so as it's looked, that's fast. Uh, okay. Okay. Because this is just running through. If I could find the pause here. Here? Here, let's do this. Let's go backwards. We'll do this to go backwards. Um, There's no pause in there. There, okay. Now, go ahead, start talking, and I'll, I'll okay. do the slides. Okay, so what we want to do is talk about chronic illness, and, and what really is described as chronic, chronic illness is it has a biological, psychological, and cognitive basis. It's lasted or expected to last for more than a year, and produces one of the following sequelae. So, as you can see here, the various limitations that it produces, and it discusses the need for medical care. So I'm going to go on because there are a series of slides. I also want to give you time to, for questions and answers specifically to the Lyme aspect of this. We're talking about chronic illness, how it affects chronic illness, but we also want to talk about how it affects Lyme. So the health issues are the nature of the illness, um, adolescence in general, what does that mean for an individual being an adolescent? Um, that's certainly a discussion for all of you who are therapists when you're working with them. What are the psychosocial problems they're encountering? And the interaction between the stage of development, the illness, and the environment. All three things are impacting the individual. And to, to notice that there are 12% of adolescents have uh, a chronic illness. Um, we also know that chronically ill children have a risk for psychological problems. And those estimates are from 9 to 37%, a pretty broad band range there. Um, and 5 to 15 percent of the general population. The most common psychosocial problems are uh, those internal problems where we look at the ones that you typically look at are anxiety, depression, fear, hopelessness, etc. But externalizing problems such as aggression and noncompliance and withdrawal, often those are looked at as just adolescent stages, but they're also illness stages with the adolescent. The somatic complaints and also the self-concept issues of a poor self-image the inability to relate with peers, um, also social and educational difficulties, which are a big part of Lyme disease patients, as well as other chronic illness patients. So <clears throat> those are areas that we want to look at. Go on. Okay, so some of the factors related in here with adolescents is the cognitive factors, how those change in an individual with a chronic illness their ability to first understand the illness, which is an awareness factor, and then understand the cognitive factors that impact them, and also the perceptions of the disease. Those are varying perceptions, perceptions by the individual and how they perceive their disease, 
the perceptions of how others uh, view this individual and the disease, and the emotional and psychological factors, patient education, what do we provide for them, factors related to a teenager's environment, family functioning, because we know that with chronic illness, one of the key components to be able to combat chronic illness is not only the awareness and the individual intervention, but also the family intervention. And peer influence, which is one of probably the number one thing in all adolescents' mind, is how do they react to the peers around them, and how do they relate to the roles that are constructed by those peers and their integration of that role. Um, fact is related to the setting and communication is the relationship with the healthcare team. You are part of that, the other doctors are. Uh, relationships with um, their families, the complexity of the therapeutic regimen that they're undergoing. I'm seeing eight doctors instead of one. Um, the kinds of reactions they have to that medical team. And the result of that, those uh, appointments how they disrupt their whole social schedule and their sense of who they are um, and the uh, interference with the treatment. So that's part of what we're looking at, as well as the computer and trying to get it to work. But it's, okay. okay, so the effects on children and adolescents are this is, we're looking at what happens psychologically to individuals who have chronic illness. There's an infantilization factor that goes on um, certainly, that's one that parents can inculcate, making the child feel more infantilized, or the child re sees this within the treatment modality and wants to become infant-like. So that has to be looked out for. The adoption of a sick role, that has advantages uh, to some, not advantages to others. And in fact, the lack of adoption of a sick role is a problem too. Because if, in fact, you are sick and you refuse to recognize that, then that causes multiple problems within your functioning. And also, the egocentricity persists until late adolescence because you've been so focused on that now you continue to expect that kind of focus being directed at you. So there's an egocentricity there. Um, impaired development of the sense of sexual self, the sexual attractiveness for boys, you know can I do this for girls, can I do that, what should I do in order to integrate myself with my peers, whether in fact I should throw away certain kinds of um, religious beliefs, spiritual beliefs, family beliefs in order to integrate myself with a peer group or not, um, if I do maintain them, what that means. Um, the effects are poor adherence and poor disease control due to all of those things that you see there, and I'm not going to go through every one of them. If you have a question on those, you certainly can ask them. We'll go to the next slide. We think we'll go to the next slide. Okay. So there, there is another aspect of the effects on children. What does it do socially to them? There's a reduced sense of independence. They don't have control over their lives. The illness does. Medical appointments do. Parents do. This lack of, and, and this developmental issue is where you're supposed to be developing this sense of independence over this adolescent period and young adult period seems to be taken away from you. And so that interferes with later development. And critical incident development is very important in the later issues of a person's life as an adult. Uh, failure in peer relationships, uh, social isolation. I'm sick, I can't get to do all the things, I can't get to the prom, I can't go to the football game, I'm extruded from all of these, these after school activities or in school activities because I can't get to school. So I'm socially isolated. What does that mean when I do start feeling better? Can I integrate myself back in or not? Um, and educational failure and vocational failure. Those things are key in how a person views themselves and how they view their relationship with the outside world. Yeah. Okay. So, a couple of other things that are important in the, the effects on childhood is the interference of the disease on the, the growth process um, and the degree of invalidity or incapacity, um, the visibility of the disease, for side effects, how does it appear to people in my social environment, can I mask it? Often Lyme patients want to mask what's going on in their lives. They don't want other people to know. Um, the prognosis. Um, you ask the person, well, what does the doctor tell you? Typically, teenagers are going to say, I don't know. Ask my mom. Ask my dad. Um, 
and that is not what you want to do because you want to build self-efficacy. You want to build the ability for that person to have an advocacy built into themselves so that they can confront these issues as they go on in life. The more you reduce that and restrict it, the less, the less they're going to be for an advocate for themselves. Um,